In the fascinating Surviving James Dean, William Bast recounts his five-year relationship with a legendary actor. In 1956, shortly after Dean's death, Bast wrote his first memoir of their friendship, but in that puritanical time, he wasn't able to tell the whole story, and the homosexual aspect of their association was never mentioned. Now, Bast has rewritten the story, this time candidly but delicately discussing the sexual nature of their relationship, as well as their close friendship. As Turner Classic Movies says in Movie News 2006, Surviving James Dean divulges the truth of Dean's existence years after his story was distorted by peripheral figures and is told by a man who has survived the evolving myth surrounding Dean since his death. Welcome to The Writing Show, where writing is always the story. I'm your host, Paula B., here with my guest today, William Bast. William Bast is an author and writer-producer for film and television. Born and raised in Milwaukee, he was educated at the University of Wisconsin and UCLA. He has written James Dean, a biography, The Myth Makers, a television drama inspired by the hoopla surrounding Dean's funeral, more than 200 hours of television drama in the U.S. and the U.K., and three feature films. He lives in Los Angeles with his longtime partner, Paul Hewson. Welcome to The Writing Show, Bill. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. My pleasure to be here. I found your book, Surviving James Dean, absolutely riveting. I could not put it down. Why did you write Surviving James Dean? Well, I think it was a combination of pressure from the outside and conscience from the inside. People and friends had been pressing me to tell the whole story, you know, knowing that it couldn't be full, fully told at the time. The first book was written, and the which was, at that, by the way, that was within months after Dean died, uh, in a world, the world was far less sophisticated than ours today. Also, another young writer had written a hardcover bio of Dean in the disease in which my relationship with Dean had been entirely misconstrued. So I felt I needed to set the record straight there. Well, what kinds of misconceptions were there about James Dean that you were trying to set right? Well, they were reaching for a lot of sort of extraneous things. They were trying to uh, sort of like pin down who James Dean really was and what his associations were. And some of them uh, had him as, you know, as a gay Lothario, and some of them had him simply as gay. And these things were not either well well presented or intelligently presented or true necessarily. So I felt I had to sort of straighten that out and say, listen, you know, I knew him the best, I was his closest friend, and I knew him the best for the longest time. I'll try to give a portrait that's fair and clear. So the book really is the story of your friendship with James Dean, starting from the time that you met and going through his death and beyond. And it's your story as much as his, of course. Well, it, it, yes, to a great degree. It's like I was there and I'm telling it from my point of view, and I guess I, you have to walk through it with me. But actually, there's a lot about you. I mean, it's a memoir of you as well and, and your life and your thoughts. Well, I, you know, when you're doing something like a biography, uh, that is as personal as this biography. It's not just a distant biography. I wasn't writing an autobiography. I mean, a biography of you know uh, Mark Twain. I was writing as a real close friend. So the interrelationship had to be between two people, and the events were shared by two people. And you don't know one of them. You know the other one on film, but you don't know him thoroughly, and you don't know me at all. So in order to understand my point of view and my perspective seeing it from my perspective. You have to know who I am and what my prejudices were and what my inclinations were, etc. And that's why I included myself. Otherwise, to distance myself would have been very, very difficult because there was a lot of interacting going on that revealed a lot about Dean. Tell us about the book that you wrote right after he died. Well, 
ostensibly it was, I would say, almost the same book, except it wasn't as frank and forthright and in depth as the second book, this new book, because time there was different. Times were different. You couldn't go into some subjects, and you, and in, in any case, the degree of respect for the subject matter, meaning Jimmy himself. Uh, I mean, he had he was still freshly gone, and not 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 just a myth. And it was very very touchy. Uh, some areas were so very touchy to go into immediately after his death. You know, speak well of the dead was the, was, was, is the old uh, saying. And um, so I was I was partic- I was younger. I was particularly cautious in terms of respecting his image and him. And I didn't approach it with a kind of um, probing, searching, revealing technique that I, I ultimately would do that most biographers do. In your book, you made so clear the contradictions in Dean's personality. Obviously, they were really there, but how did you make them come across so clearly in the book? Well, I suppose you have to remember that the person who wrote the book, I mean, if you're going to ask that question, uh, I I was a budding dramatist at the time, and I was looking into character and dealing with character all the time. I was learning to watch people, to study them so that I could get it right, you know what I mean? And here I had the perfect subject, the one I knew best. Set the scene a little bit for us at the time that you met James Dean. What was going on in your life and his life? Well, we were, you know, when I met Dean, we were both going to UCLA. And we were both sort of like, well, he had just been kicked out of his fraternity and was looking for, you know, was was looking for a place to live. And I was looking for a place to live because I was living in a dorm that I hated. And so when we discovered that we had this news, we were in, you know, in the theater arts department at UCLA, and we saw one another frequently and be- had become friends. He was, he was dating my, the girl I was dating's best friend, and we became foursome. And Dean and I, you know, grew closer and closer together as a result of seeing so much of one another. And then finally, when he got bumped from the fraternity, and I was living in a dorm I hated, we both said, hey, let's look for a place. And we did. We looked for it and found it in Santa Monica. And you have a, a great introduction to your first meeting on page two of the book where Dean is playing Prince Malcolm in the Scottish play at UCLA. <laughs> and you, uh, you have a quote from the play with him with his accent. <laughs> and I, I, it was, it's wonderful. I don't know if I should read it or if you should read it because I'm not so great at that. Shall I read it? I don't have the text in front of me, I don't think. Oh, okay. Well, let me let me just... <laughs> the way you, you have the spelling... Yeah, I did it phonetically. Right. We shall not spend a large, expensive time before we reckon with your several loves, loves and make us even with you. And then you say, I cringed as he twanged on relentlessly to the end. And I'm sure I didn't do that justice. But I love the way you did that. Tell us about how you felt when you heard that. And this was before you knew him. This was right when you were meeting him. Well, I turned to the person sitting next to me because it was, it was in a rehearsal. You know, it was a rehearsal, and, and there were only about know, eight or ten people there who were technical crew, etc. And I was part of, you know, what what was going on backstage, as it were. And we're sitting out in the in in the Royce Hall Auditorium listening to this. And I just turned and, and I sort of said. Who's the who's the heck up there? Where do they get him? He can't even pronounce half the words. I was just, I couldn't be, couldn't believe they had this Hoosier Hick playing playing in Shakespeare. I love that story. Dean had a very serious approach to his art, which evolved over time. But can you tell us a little bit about what his approach to acting and his art were like? Yes, of course. First of all, I, I organized a uh, an acting group just after Dean and I started living together in Santa Monica. Uh, 
decided to get some of our friends together from the theater arts department in, at UCLA and have, uh, you know, just see if we could get an actor. I had met, I was working at CBS and, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as an usher at CBS Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater used to be Cecil B. DeMille's uh, show, used to do um, radio abbreviated radio versions of popular mo movies at the, peri at the period at the time. And James Whitmore was, was in the tank, and I got to know him and chatting with him, etc. And one day I said, you know, there are a bunch of us at UCLA who really would like to seriously study acting. And he said, well, why don't we form a, a, an acting class? I said, you mean you would be willing to t sort of teach us? He said, I'll work with you, yeah. And that's how it, it grew. It was, Whitmore was very, very kind and outgoing. And he got the Brentwood Country Mart, had a place upstairs, a little sort of like a, you know, what you call a little, little a tiny auditorium, as it were. And he got them to lend it to him on, on I think it was Saturday mornings, uh, so that we could uh, have meet. And I gathered some people at UCLA together, and we all had this acting class with James Whitmore. Dean's philosophy of acting was very interesting, though. I mean, he was very serious about it, and he had an approach that you detail in the book. I'm thinking particularly of pages 14 and 15 and page 179. One of the main things that I was thinking of was the way he said you have to experience so much. that You have to get out there and live and try everything and do everything and, you know, experience things. Right. As we got into the deeper acting, you know, motivation. See, James Whitmore was a product of the Actors Studio in New York. And in, at UCLA, we were studying and we had acting teachers, but they had never been, uh, they had not been involved in such high-powered professional theater as Broadway. They, they had, uh, you know, collegiate backgrounds and... Uh, they were very good, but here was a guy who could teach us the way it was going, and he had been part of the actor's studio in New York. Neely Kazan had put it together. And this was very impressive to us. And so when I, I met him, uh, I, as I was working at CBS, he was in a production of Battleground that they were doing on the air in what they used to call the Lux Radio Theater, and where they would do dramatizations of current movies that were popular uh, on the radio read, read the, the scripts rather than uh, show them. Anywhere. And I got to know Whitmore because he was involved in a couple of those readings and those, in those casts. And here was this idea that we should have an acting class. So I asked him if he would do it. He was a graduate of the actor's studio in New York and he had studied under you know, Kazan and uh, well, well, what could be better? And it was very good. It was, it was they really dug in, much more than we were doing at UCLA in the formal education area. Here, it was more casual and more intense. And you have some interesting descriptions of it in the book. But also, on page 15, you talk about Dean's attitude toward acting, and he says, that's why I'm going to stick to this thing. I don't want to be just a good actor. I don't even want to be just the best. I want to grow and grow, grow so tall nobody can reach me. Not to prove anything, but just to go where you ought to go when you devote your whole self and all you are to one thing. Yeah, that was a speech that was almost, I mean, I, I could almost capture verbatim in my memory because he gave it, it, it happened on a bus going into Hollywood where we were both working. I was working as an usher at CBS and he was working over, doing some stuff over at Jerry Fairbanks studio nearby. And it was such an intense, um, the, the speech itself was, what, that whole thing was said so, with such intensity and such determination that it left in a very deep impression on me, which is why I was able to evoke it, you see, so, so almost, it's not exact, but I mean, in essence, that was basically what he was saying and how he was saying it. And he, it was coming from, you know, it was coming from his heart. 
On page 179, you talk about Stanislavski. An actor's duty is to interpret life. To do so, he must be willing to accept every experience that life has to offer. And Dean did that. I mean, you show in the book how, how so much that he did. In fact, there's one part that really sticks in my mind and is really unforgettable, where he goes out in the middle of the night and goes to sit on a bus stop. Can you tell us about that part? I think it's uh, referring to the part where we're living in Santa Monica. It's a little penthouse on top of a, a little apartment, just a tiny apartment building. And it was late at night. He had gone out. Uh, and I I didn't know. I did, when I came back, I, I didn't know he had gone out. And I, I suddenly discovered when I opened my drawer that <clears throat> a flick knife that my grandfather had given me you press a button and the blade flicks out, was missing. And he was missing. And it was quite late. So I couldn't figure out what was going on. I think I went out to, to see where he was. Uh, I can't remember whether I was... Um, I think I went out to see if I could find him. It was a coffee shop he used to go to, and it stayed open very late. When I got down to Wilshire Boulevard, or, or, or Santa Monica Boulevard, I can't remember which, he, he was sitting on a bus bench, wait, as if he was waiting for a bus, with a flick knife in his hand. And when people would pass by, uh, sometimes there would be men cruising other men, he would flick the knife open. And they'd take off. He just wouldn't say anything, just that they're you know, playing with his knife and flick it open and then just look at him. And they just take off. And I, it gave me, well, it shook me up a lot. I thought, what have we got here? This is the person I'm rooming with. Didn't know this. And I let it go. I never said anything about it. The knife was back in its place. That was just an amazing story. It really sticks in my mind. There's a part in the book on page 23 that I found really fascinating. And it goes like this. Suddenly I was somebody else and I didn't know who. Intuitively, I knew my whole life would be different from now on. But how? What does a queer do? Where does he go? How does he dress? What does he think? Whom does he love? I needed a role model here, some guidance. But where to find an acceptable role model in a repressive society that shunned homosexuals and legislated homosexual acts as crimes? And then you go on to say, you know, refer to later, there were clubs and gay pride parades and internet chat rooms and parents for gays and lesbians. But at the time, there was nothing like that. That's right. Well, you know, th there was an expression, or probably still exists, but there was an expression that was that gay a gay was in the closet. Well, it means he was hiding. Well, and there was a good reason for hiding. It was against the law. Go to prison. Yeah, so you were unsure of your whole sexuality at the time, it sounded like, from the book. And, you know, what, what do you do with it? I was learning more about my sexuality. I was actually, I was still going, I was going with a girl at, at, at UCLA at the time. But, this other thing was, you know, tugging at me constantly. And finally, you know, I said, this is obviously who I am. Well, you really told your story very beautifully, I thought, because you brought up a lot of the questions that you were facing and dealing with, and you sort of showed your development. You know, this happened, and then I felt this way, and that happened, and I felt that way, and all the while, you know, you were close to Dean, and then you had a falling out, and, you know, then you were close to him again. And it was just a wonderful story. I mean, I know it was hard for you to live through, but it was just such a wonderful story, and you presented it so beautifully. It, it was very difficult dredging it all up, but, and, the, and the aspect about me, uh, you know, dredging me up into it, I, I had to be... I had to be, I, I felt I had to be honest with the reader 
I had to tell the reader who I was so they could see through whose eyes they were seeing Dean. It would be unfair of me to say, this is the way he was, period. No, this is the way he was to me, was the point. And I am somebody who's looking at him with very special inclinations, attitudes, education, etc. You just simply had to understand that this was through my eyes, and this may not have been your particular impression of Dean if you knew him. That's a very good point, because you weren't really trying to write an objective biography. No, I wasn't. I was just telling about, I was really telling, telling you about my friend. It must have been very wrenching for you. I mean, you, you make a point in the book about how hard it is even now, all this time later, for you, and, and the reactions that you get, or the, the way that you've lived through the sort of James Dean phenomenon all these years. And then writing about Dean and writing about yourself, I, I can't imagine how it must, it must be so difficult. Well, it's easy to look at it if you just think what I, the way I look at it. James Dean never died. He's here all the time, every day. I'm on the phone about him again, am I not? He's a different image, different person. He never had a chance to grow old. He was always a vital, exciting, interesting, young man with promise and with, you know, the world in his hand, as it were, and it, it was all gone. It, 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 it's stuff that, that novels are made of and, uh, and legends. But as long as that stuff is on film, every generation that comes up sees it and grabs on to it. I, I, I have noticed, and I guess we've all noticed. And he's still there. He's still, you know, he's still a star. <laughs> he's still with us. It's incredible. How has the James Dean phenomenon changed since he first died and to now? Or has it? Well, I guess it has evolved, yes. I mean, when he first died, there was an awful lot of heart-wrenching, you know, uh, mourning going on amongst the younger people, and particularly girls who were, you know, totally infatuated, and there was, you know, uh, there, were, there were James Dean fan clubs uh, where they would have literally crying sessions. But the, all that's gone, gone. Now it's just the image of this young guy who had this extraordinarily promising career and had this very vital with living this exciting and vital life, just beginning his career in movies and making some incredibly you know, powerful impressions, and bang, suddenly it was all over. And there's something about it, there's nothing out of a, of a, a very promising life like that that people uh, just respond to. And, and, and um, you know, there's a kind of a quiet wish that it hadn't happened that he had gone on. That you get that feeling. And I keep saying to myself, and sometimes to other people, yeah, but how would you think about it? How would you respond? How do you think you would have responded if you were watching a movie with James Dean, now age 49 or 50, playing a role? It's just, it, it comes on, it goes on, it never stops. It really is amazing to me. Look, look at us. How long ago has it been? Do you know how many years? It's, it's been about 50 years, hasn't it? That's right. 50 years. 50 years. And I have to tell you, it's unending. How do you feel now that the book has been published? Relieved. <laughs> I mean, it's done. I don't know what you mean by how do I feel. Well, okay, relief would definitely be one, one, one reaction. Would you change anything that you said in the book or the way that you presented things or are you had just happy with the way it came out? Can I answer that after I go back and read it once I've got some distance from it? Because at the time, you know, when you just finish a book, you're just glad you finished the book and you feel you've got it right. 
And then later when you read this thing, you cringe and say, how could I have done this? You know, generally speaking, that's what happens with writers. Uh, all I can say is I put down what I knew as best I could, what I remembered as best I could. And the heart was in it as well, because it still is. You can't, I cannot go into the subject without feeling it again. How are you able to be so detailed? Because you have so much detail in the book, and it's so alive. Well, I had done an earlier book. I had done an earlier book which that was right there for me to remember. I had the detail in it because it was almost immediate. It was done within six months of Jimmy's death. So I had a chronicle of events and, and, and emotions and letters and notes, etc. So it was actually very easy to, come to, to re, you know, re, review it all. It was nice. I would say 70% of it was there. The other percent, 30%, I had to sort of rack my brains and memory for and say, yeah, this is a part I didn't put in the book, and how did that go? And just really try to remember exactly how the event happened. But there wasn't too much of that. There was very little of that. Most of it had been recorded. In the book, you had some rather uncomplimentary things to say about a few people. Did that make you nervous at all in any way? Only a few? <laughs> I don't know which people. If there were people who were, who were going to get, be angry and sue me for something I said, I was probably very wary. I don't know which ones you mean, what you mean, but um, I mean, which ones you mean in particular. All right, well, I'll cite two of them to start with. Uh, Rogers Brackett and Joan Davis. I thought we knew you when you say Rogers. It was very, e very easy, very easy for me to, to, to pinion Rogers Brackett. I, I loathed him. I called him the lizard. And Joan Davis. Well, Joan, I didn't dislike Joan. She was quite a, she was quite a dominant character. And I, what I didn't like about Joan was that she actually had dominated and intimidated her daughter to such a degree, I was going with her daughter and I said, to such a degree that it was, it was rather sad and hopeless and I, and I uh, you know, you were dealing with, a, with a, a personality who had risen from vaudeville to motion pictures and didn't have much of an education as far as uh, her uh, psychology was concerned and her appreciation for people and what makes them tick, forget it, you know. So anything I had to say about her was predicated on what I experienced of her. I liked her in when she wasn't being difficult, grand, or hurtful to people. Maybe we should back up a little and explain who Rogers Brackett and Joan Davis are for listeners who may not be familiar with them. Rogers Brackett was a uh, director of radio program, radio dramas, at CBS Hollywood. When Dean was working in the parking lot, I was an usher at CBS, meaning for ushering in audiences for audience participation shows. And Rogers was a director of dramatic shows that didn't have audiences. So I barely knew him. And Jim, Jimmy got a job working, because he was, he'd come and pick me up and things every once in a while. He finally inveigled his way into a job in the parking lot parking cars because he wanted to get a job. And um, that's how he met Rogers. And Rogers kind of eventually became kind of friendly, and then Rogers took him under his wing and said, if you really want to be an actor, let's you know, go about it in a sensible way, and started advising him on how he could get training and how he had been using him. And we are put together with Elliot uh, Lewis, um, who was a, a, a radio uh, actor and star at the time, a group of young people from UCLA uh, that, uh, and, we, and we did some, you know, some radio shows uh, and recorded them, and CBS put them on the air. And uh, Dean, I asked Dean to join that group. And, but this was all through because he, was, uh, he got a job when I was working as an usher at CBS. He got a job in the parking lot there. And that's how I met Rogers. And you didn't like him because? Well, how can I put this? 
Rogers had a way of looking down his nose at people, and I was one of the people he decided to look down his nose at, which was his first mistake. And Jim refused to let that be a barrier to our hanging out together and, you know, going places with Rogers. And Rogers had the good teeth and bear me. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. And Joan Davis was an actress. Yes. Well, she was a comedian. Very good. I liked Joan. She was very good, but she could be very tough and very sort of like um, grand, which is uncharacteristic for, for, for a comic. You know what I mean? You're expecting a comic to be kind of laid back and fun and funny. But she could she get quite sort of grand, grand herself. And she had a daughter, and I was going with her daughter, Beverly. Roger Brackett was a director for, for radio shows at CBS, not, not a well-known personality or anything like that. But Joan Davis was a major personality. She made a number of movies with Eddie, uh, starred in a number of movies with Eddie Cantor, who was, was a top comic in his day. And, and she, was, she had her own radio show, which called at NBC, and NBC uh, uh, radio show was, you know, uh, Leave It to Joan, I guess it was called. And... Um, she was very well known. When you write about, and I'm going to say when you, when people write about, not just you specifically, write about public figures, how much do you think the public is entitled to know about them? Where the line between the public figure and the privacy, you know, the privacy of that person should be drawn? Or is there a line if someone's a public figure? Well, I think while any, if, if someone is a public figure and still alive, you, you have to respect that they have to live with whatever you write. So you certainly don't want to write anything that's going to be damaging or detrimental to them while they're alive and have to keep going. Therefore, uh, you kind of withhold anything that would be too detrimental. But if you elect to become a public figure, I believe you're fair game. It's, if notoriety has been thrust upon you, that's a different matter and it's out of your control. Then I believe you have the right to seek privacy or demand that demand the respect of privacy. Would actors fall into that category? Yeah, sure. You know, they, they like publicity. Would you like to read a little for us from the book? Yeah, there's a, there's a segment here, for example, of uh, uh, after he was thrown out of his fraternity, and he suggested that we find a, um, a place uh, together, share, share an apartment together. He said the, the, the words were, he, he felt that we'd make a good team. It says in the book, uh, you know, I find it conceited, maybe you're right. We probably would make a good team. I hear there are a lot of cheap apartments down in Santa Monica. Why don't we go look? And his face lit up and like a kid. Yeah, we could start looking tomorrow. So we shook on it, and an innocent, an innocent handshake that would turn out to be the most binding contract I would ever make and last some 50 years. With lots to think about, suddenly we each drifted off into our own thoughts for a few blocks. For me, at any rate, we were on a bus. For me, at any rate, this was a big deal, and I wondered what I was getting into, where it would all lead me, lead us. But then suddenly, it hit. For the first time in my life, there was an us. Jimmy stared out the window into the night for a few minutes and then turned to me abruptly and blurted, I never told this to anyone else. Guess I always thought they'd think I was crazy, so I just kept it to myself. But I think I can trust you. He paused as if to gather courage and then searching my eyes for reassurance plunged in. Have you ever heard of the feeling that it's not in your hands? started and then paused again as if grasping for the words, as if looking for a way to express something that he'd never given voice to before, but had held closely guarded in his heart. Do you ever just know you've got something to do and you have no control of it? See, all I know is I've got to do something. I don't know exactly what it is yet, but when the time comes, I'll know. I've got to keep trying until I hit the right button. See what I mean? It's like I know I want to be an actor, but that isn't it. That's not all. Just being an actor or a director, even a good one, isn't enough. 
there's got to be more than just that. I figure there's nothing you can't do if you put everything you've got into it. The only thing that stops people from getting what they want is themselves. They put too many barricades in their paths. It's like they're afraid to succeed. In any way, in a way, I guess I know why. There's a terrific amount of responsibility that goes with success. And the greater the success, the greater the responsibility. But I think if you're not afraid, if you take everything you are, and everything worthwhile in you, and direct it at one goal, one ultimate mark, you've got to get there. If you start accepting the world, letting things happen to you, around you, things will happen like you never dreamed. That's why I'm going to stick to this thing. I don't want to be just a good actor. I don't even want to be just the best. I want to grow and grow, grow so tall nobody can reach me. Not to prove anything, but just to go where you ought to go when you devote your whole self and all you are to one thing. Maybe this sounds crazy or egocentric or something, but I think there's only one true form of greatness for a man. If a man can bridge the gap between life and death, I mean, if he can live on after he's died, then maybe he was a great man. When they talk about success, they talk about reaching the top. But there is no top. You've got to go on and on and never stop at any point. To me, the only success, the only true greatness for man lies in immortality. To have your work remembered in history, to leave something in this world that will last for generations, centuries even, that's greatness. That's absolutely chilling in light of what happened. I mean, he did achieve immortality, and he was, what, about 20 years old when he said that? Uh, yeah, I guess, let's see, he died when he was 24. He would be, yeah, he, would have, he was 20, maximum 21, 20, 20, maybe even 19. That's just incredible. Not only the foreshadowing, but also the fact that at 19 or 20, he could be so wise beyond his years. He was, uh, in, in some sense, always very shrewd and always very self-motivated and driven. I mean, whatever he did, he did to excess. To, you know, he, he was a good basketball player. He took my breath away one time at a, a birthday party. Joan, the comedian Joan Davis, I was going with her daughter, Beverly Wills, and it was Beverly's birthday. She had a big birthday party at Joan Davis's mansion in Be in Bel Air, and there was you know, the swimming pool and you know, all the kids and everything. And Dean joined us at the party. He was working or something at uh, a job he had at, uh, in, in Hollywood. He came and joined us at the party, and had brought a swimming suit. He got out there on the diving board. Now I had known him for probably. And I was actually, we were showing, we were rooming together in Santa Monica, for, probably for the better part of a year. I had no idea he could even swim. He got on the diving board, and he gave a diving exposition that was astounding. I mean, I, it was so incredibly professional, and it was so gymnastic, I couldn't believe what I was watching. And everybody else, too. I mean, it was applauded, you know, by the whole, the whole party applauded. Joan Davis, at first Joan Davis, who didn't like him very much, it was her daughter's birthday, was really sort of scowling and something like, oh, he's going to, you know, he got on the diving board to show off, you know, clown. And suddenly, you know, she was standing, she, was amazed, she herself was amazed, her jaw was dropping the way he, he was absolutely fantastic. The control and the diving technique, which... Um, I thought, where did he get this? I never knew he could do this. And I was, I'd been living with him for you know, almost a year. He was full of surprises. And that really comes across in the book. Well, I tried. <laughs> it was mesmerizing to know him. He just were always fa absolutely fascinated with what, with what he was going to do next. Not always satisfied. You were always said fascinated. Don't get the idea that he was in, in any way an angel. <laughs> Could be very difficult. And that too comes across in the book. Good. <laughs> if he was difficult at times, aren't we all? But he had his own special brand. Bill, is there anything that I, we haven't touched on that you would like to talk about? Well, I just want, you know, he was, 
a dearly beloved friend, and he he left us too soon. He was at the peak of his career. It was a very serious, very sad, sad tragedy. Absolutely awful. Which he brought on himself because of those damn cars. He insisted upon racing. And he'd been warned, and it, it happened. And there was suddenly it was all over. It was all over. And what what a fantastic thing it was while it was you know, while it was building. And it was still building. It was still building and he cut it off. It's very, very unfortunate that he did that. Because I think he had miles and miles and miles to go. Let me just ask you one other question. Why do you write? I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> Good answer. I'm lazy. I like sitting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, it's a very difficult. I, I write because people pay me to write. I, I write because I like to write. I write because it's the only artistic expression. You know, you don't want to see me act. So I might as well write. Thank you so much for being with us today on The Writing Show, Bill. You're welcome. This has just been wonderful. I love the book. You're very sweet. I, I, I really appreciate it. That. That's very comforting. Again, that's Surviving James Dean by William Bast, published by Barricade Books. There's an affiliate link to the book at Barnes & Noble on our website with the notes for this show. <laughs>